everyone. Welcome to Intermediate Accounting, Chapter 10, where we talk about property plant equipment along with intangible assets. Chapter 10 is going to address the measurement and the reporting issues involving PP&E along with intangibles. And the tangible and intangible long-lived assets that are used in the production of goods and services. We're also going to take a look at the valuation of assets at the date of acquisition. So for financial reporting purposes, long-lived revenue producing assets or are generally classified into two categories. So the PP&E assets include land, land improvements, building, machinery used in manufacturing, computers and other office equipment, vehicles, furniture, and fixtures. Also, natural resources such as oil and gas deposits, timber tracks and mineral deposits are also included in this category. With intangible assets, these lack physical substance and the extent and timing of their future benefits can be really uncertain. These include patents, copyrights, trademarks, franchises, along with goodwill. For every company, it maintains its own unique mixture of assets. Now, the way these assets are classified and combined for financial reporting purposes varies from company to company. An example, as you see here, Semtech Corporation, a leading supplier of semiconductor products, reported net property plant and equipment of 101,006,000 and 115,471,000 at the end of the fiscal year 2016 and 15. A disclosure note provides the details of the breakdown. In practice, some companies report intangibles as part of property, plant, and equipment, and others show intangibles as a separate balance sheet category. An example, Lane Christensen Company, a large construction and exploration company, reported goodwill of 8915000 and other intangible assets of six. 991,000 in a recent balance sheet. A disclosure note provides details of the other intangible assets. This slide provides a description of some assets usually included in property, plant, and equipment, along with what costs are typically included with these acquisitions. As you see here, Equipment can include machinery, computers, office equipment, vehicles, furniture, and fixtures. And the acquisition cost isn't just the purchase price, but taxes, transportation, installation, testing, trial runs, and reconditioning. Where land, of course, is real property, includes the purchase price, attorney fees, title, recording fees, commissions, any back taxes that the buyer may pay, mortgages, liens, clearing, filling, draining, and the removing of old buildings. Land improvements, enhancements such as property, art parking lots, driveways, private roads and fencing, landscaping and sprinkler systems, will include any identifiable costs for those improvements. Buildings include not just the purchase price, but attorney fees, commissions, and any reconditioning. And then natural resources include the acquisition, the exploration, development, and any restoration costs. Now, PP&E and intangible assets can be acquired through purchase. They can be acquired through an exchange, 
lease donation, self-construction, or a business combination. The initial valuation of property, plant, and equipment, along with intangibles, usually is pretty simple. Assets are valued on the basis of their original cost. So, for example, if Thompson Company purchased inventory for $42,000 and incurred $1,000 in freight costs to have the inventory shipped, then the initial cost of the inventory would be $43,000. This concept applies to the valuation of property, plant, and equipment along with intangibles as well. So the initial cost of these assets includes the purchase price and all expenditures necessary to bring the asset to its desired condition and location for use. Equipment is a broad term. It encompasses machinery used in manufacturing, computers, and other office equipment, vehicles, furniture, and fixtures. The cost of equipment includes the purchase price along with sales tax, transportation costs paid by the buyer to transport the asset to the location in which it's going to be used, also expenditures for installation, testing, any legal fees to establish title, and any other cost of bringing the asset to its condition and location for use. To the extent that these costs can be identified and measured, they should be included in the asset's initial valuation rather than expensed currently. So even though most costs can be identified easily, other costs can be more difficult. An example, the cost of training personnel to operate machinery could be considered a cost necessary to make the asset ready for use. But because it's difficult to measure the amount of training costs associated with specific events, usually these costs are expensed. As you see in this slide, each of the expenditures described was necessary to bring the machine to its condition and location for use and should be capitalized and then expensed in the future periods in which the asset is used. So we're starting off with our first concept question. As you see here, the following expenses relate to equipment purchased by Symington Corporation. You see here we have a purchase price of 48000 Transportation costs of $2,400, installation and special wiring of $1,500, and then testing of $6,000. So what would Symington record as the purchase of this equipment? Well, basically, B, which would include all of that, not just the purchase price, but the transportation cost to get it to its place of use, the installation and wiring, and the testing. $57,900. Now, the cost of land also should include expenditures necessary to get the land ready for its intended use. These include the purchase price plus closing costs such as attorney fees, real estate agent commissions, title and title search along with recording. If the property is subject to back taxes, liens, mortgages, or other obligations, these amounts also would be included. Any expenditures such as clearing the land, filling it, draining it, and even moving old buildings that are needed to prepare the land for its intended use are part of the land's cost. Proceeds from the sale of salvaged materials from old buildings torn down after the purchase can help reduce the cost of the land. So in this slide, the Buyers Structural Metal Company purchased a six-acre tract of land and an existing building for 500000 The company plans to 
remove, raise the old building and construct a new office building on the site. Also, in addition to the purchase price, the company also paid other expenses, as you see here, related to the purchased land. Now the capitalized cost of the land is determined, shown on the slide I'm getting ready to provide. As you see here, property taxes of 2000 are not included because these only relate to the current period and need to be expensed in the period. Other costs were necessary to acquire the land and all of those are then capitalized with the land. So it's important to distinguish between the cost of land and the cost of land improvements because land has an indefinite life while land improvements usually have useful lives that are estimated. Examples of land improvements include the cost of establishing parking lots and driveways and private roads, the cost of fences and lawns and garden sprinkler systems. Costs of these assets are separately identified and they're capitalized. We depreciate land improvement costs over periods benefited by their use. The cost of acquiring a building usually includes realtor commissions and legal fees in addition to the purchase price. Often a building must be refurnished, refurbished, remodeled, so it's modified to suit the needs of the new owner. These reconditioning costs are part of the building's acquisition costs. Natural resources that provide long-term benefits are reported as property, plant, and equipment. These can include timber tracks, mineral deposits, oil and gas deposits. They're distinguished from other assets by the fact that their benefits are derived from their physical consumption. For example, mineral deposits are physically diminishing as the minerals are extracted from the ground. They're either sold or used in the production process. On the contrary, equipment, land, and buildings produce benefits for a company through their use in the production of goods and services. Unlike those of natural resources, their physical characteristics usually remain unchanged during their useful life. Sometimes companies buy natural resources from other companies. So in that case, the initial valuations simply purchase price plus any cost necessary to bring the asset to condition and location for use. Often, the company will develop these assets. In this situation, the initial valuation would include the acquisition cost, the exploration cost, development cost, restoration cost. Now, acquisition costs are the amount paid to acquire the rights to explore for undiscovered natural resources or to extract proven natural resources. Exploration costs are expenditures such as drilling a well or excavating a mine or any cost of searching for natural resources. While development costs are incurred after the resource has been discovered but before production begins, they can include a variety of costs like expenditures for tunnels, wells, and shafts. It's not unusual for the cost of a natural resource either purchased or developed also to include restoration costs. These are costs to restore land or other property to its original condition after extraction of the natural resource ends. Because restoration expenditures occur later on, of course after production begins, they initially represent an obligation incurred in conjunction with an asset retirement. 
Now, on the other hand, the cost of equipment and other long-lived assets a company uses during drilling or excavation usually are not considered part of the cost of the natural resource. Instead, they're considered depreciable plant and equipment. But if an asset used in the development of a natural resource can't be moved and has no alternative use, then its depreciable life is limited by only the useful life of the natural resource. Sometimes a company incurs obligations associated with the disposition of PP&E and other natural resources, often as a result of acquiring those assets. So for example, an oil and gas exploration company might be required to restore land to its original condition after extraction is completed. Before 2001, there was considerable diversity in the ways companies accounted for these obligations. Some companies recognized these asset retirement obligations gradually over the life of the asset, while others didn't recognize the obligations until the asset was retired or sold. GAP now require that existing legal obligation associated with the retirement of a tangible, long-lived asset be recognized as a liability and be measured at fair value, if value can be reasonably estimated. But when a liability is credited, the offsetting debit is to the related asset. These retirement obligations could arise in connection with several types of assets. Let's consider some of the provisions of the standard that addresses these obligations. So AROs arise only from legal obligations associated with the retirement of a tangible, long-lived asset that result from the acquisition, construction or development, and the normal operation of a long-lived asset. A retirement obligation must arise at the inception of an asset's life or during its operating life. For example, an offshore oil and gas production facility typically incurs its removal obligation when it begins operating. On the other hand, a landfill or a mining operation might incur a reclamation obligation gradually over the life of the asset as space is consumed with waste or as the mine is excavated. That would be the recognition. Now with measurement, a company recognizes the fair value of an ARO in the period it's incurred. The amount of the liability increases the valuation of the related asset. Usually, the fair value is estimated by calculating the present value of estimated future cash flows. Traditionally, the way uncertainty has been considered in present value calculations has been by discounting the best estimate of future cash flows, applying a discount rate that's been adjusted to reflect the uncertainty or risk of those cash flows. That's not the approach we take here. Instead, we follow the approach described in FASB's concept statement number seven, which is to adjust the cash flows, not the discount rate, for the uncertainty or risk of those cash flows. So this expected cash flow approach incorporates specific probabilities of cash flows into the analysis. We use a discount rate equal to the credit adjusted risk free rate. The higher a company's credit risk, the higher will be the discount rate. All other uncertainties or risks are incorporated into the cash flow probabilities. Now this slide demonstrates the approach in connection with the acquisition of a natural resource. As you see here, the Jackson Mining Company paid $1 million 
for the right to explore for a coal deposit on 500 acres of land in Pennsylvania. Cost of exploring for the coal deposit totaled 800000 and intangible development costs incurred in digging and erecting the mine shafts were 500000 In addition, Jackson purchased new excavation equipment for the project at a cost of 600000 After the coal is removed from the site, the equipment will be sold. So Jackson's required by its contract to restore the land to a condition suitable for recreational use after it extracts the coal. The company's provided three cash flow possibilities, A, B, and C, for the restoration costs to be paid in three years after extraction is completed. The company's credit-adjusted risk-free interest rate is 8%. So possibility A is an outflow of 500000 with a 30% probability, B 600000 with a 50% probability, and then C, 700,000 with a 20% probability. So we first determine the present value of expected cash outflows for restoration costs using the company's credit adjusted risk-free interest rate. From the given data of cash flow possibilities, the present value of the expected cash flows equals $468,360. So the total capitalized cost of coal deposit, the sum of purchase and exploration development, and the restoration cost is $2,768,000. And three hundred and sixty dollars, two million seven sixty eight three sixty. So let's just take a look at that. The purchase of rights, along with the exploration cost, development cost, and then the restoration cost come below. The way we compute those restoration costs are based on those three probabilities. So we take those together. We come up with the present value of that amount at an interest rate of 8%, number of periods of 3, to come up with the present value, 468,360, to total our total cost of the coal deposit. Now, the following journal entries record these transactions. First, we debit coal mine for two million seven sixty eight three sixty as we saw earlier. We credit cash for two hundred two million three hundred thousand, which is the one million and the eight hundred thousand and the five hundred thousand. Then we credit asset retirement liability, which we determined on the previous slide for four sixty eight. 360. Next, we record the purchase of new excavation equipment for the project by debiting excavation equipment for the 600,000 cost and crediting cash for the same amount. The difference between the asset retirement liability of 468.360 which is the present value, and the probability weighted expected cash outflow of 590000 is recognized as accretion expense, an additional expense that accrues as an operating expense over the three-year excavation period. This 
process increases the liability to 590000 by the end of the excavation period. So you see here that the journal entry to record the accretion expense for the first year is made by debiting accretion expense to 37469 and crediting asset retirement liability for the same amount. So if the actual restoration costs are more or less than the 590000 we're going to recognize a loss or a gain on retirement of the obligation for the difference. An example, suppose the actual restoration costs are $600,000 and then $25,000. Well, in order to record this transaction, we reduce the asset retirement liability by $590,000. We're going to credit our cash for $625,000. Then we'll debit a loss for the difference in the amount, so the 625 minus the 590 or $35,000. So let's look at another concept question. The Wendell Mining Company paid $50 million for the right to explore and extract copper from land owned by the state of Wyoming. To obtain the rights, Winderall agreed to restore the land to a suitable condition for other uses after its exploration and extraction activities. Winderall incurred exploration and development costs of $15 million on the project. The company's credit-adjusted risk-free interest rate is 6%. It estimates the possible cash flows for restoring the land three years after its extraction activities begin as follows. So a cash outflow of $5 million gives us a 40% probability, whereas a cash outflow of $10 million is a 60% probability. So what is the initial cost of the copper mine? So the way this will be calculated is by taking the expected cash outflow, the 5 million times 40%, the 10 million times 60% gives us 8 million. Then we come up with the present value of that 8 million where the interest rate is 6, number of periods is 3. So we've got our 50 million plus our 15 million exploration and development costs plus the present value of the expected cash outflow of 6,716,960 ,06 to come up with 71,716,960 dollars. So intangible assets are long-lived assets other than financial assets that lack physical substance. They include items as patents, copyrights, trademarks, franchises, and goodwill. Despite their lack of physical evidence or substance, these assets can be extremely valuable resources for a company. In general, intangible assets refer to the ownership of exclusive rights that provide future benefits to the owner in the production of goods and services. Companies can either purchase intangible assets from other entities, existing patent, copyrights, trademarks, or franchise rights, or they can develop intangible assets internally, such as develop a, a new product or process that is then patented. Intangible assets with finite useful lives are amortized. Intangible assets with indefinite useful lives are not amortized. 
So the initial valuation of purchased intangible assets usually is pretty simple because we value a purchased intangible at its original cost, which includes its purchase price and all other necessary costs to bring it to a condition and location for intended use. So if a company purchases a patent from another entity, it might pay legal fees and filing fees in addition to the purchase price. We value intangible assets acquired in exchange for stock or for other non-monetary assets or with deferred payment contracts exactly as we do property, plant, and equipment. A patent is an exclusive right to manufacture a product or to use a process. This right is granted by the U.S. Patent Office for a period of 20 years. In essence, the holder of a patent has a monopoly on the use, manufacture, or sale of the product or process. If a patent is purchased from an inventor or another individual or company, then the amount paid is its initial valuation. The cost might also include other costs as legal and filing fees to secure the patent. Holders of patents often need to defend a patent in court against infringement. Any attorney fees or other costs of successfully defending a patent are added to the patent account. A copyright is an exclusive right of production given to a creator of a published work such as a song, film, painting, photograph, or book. Copyrights are protected by law and give the creator the exclusive right to reproduce and sell the artistic or published work for the life of the creator plus an additional 70 years. Accounting for the cost of copyright is identical to that of patents. A trademark, can also be called a trade name, is an exclusive right to display a word, a slogan, a symbol, or an emblem that distinctively identifies a company, a product, or a service. The trademark can be registered with the U.S. Patent Office, which protects the trademark from use by others for a period of 10 years. The registration can be renewed for an indefinite number of 10-year periods. So a trademark is an example of an intangible asset whose useful life could be indefinite. And then last, a franchise is a contractual arrangement under which the franchisor grants the franchisee the exclusive right to use the franchisor's trademark or trade name and may include product and formula rights within a geographical area, usually for a specified period of time. Many popular retail businesses such as fast food outlets, automobile dealerships, and motels are franchises. Payments to the franchisor usually include an initial payment plus periodic payments over the life of the franchise agreement. The franchisee capitalizes on an intangible asset, the fran initial franchise fee, plus any legal costs associated with the contract agreement. The franchise asset is amortized over the life of the franchise agreement. The periodic payments usually relate to services provided by the franchisor on a continuing basis and are expensed as incurred. Goodwill is a unique intangible asset in that its cost can't be directly associated with any specifically identifiable right, and it is not separable from the company itself. It represents the unique value of a company as a whole, owner, over and above its identifiable, tangible, and intangible assets. Goodwill can emerge from a company's clientele and reputation, its trained employees and management team, its favorable business location, and any other unique features of the company that can't be associated with a specific event. Because goodwill can't be separated from a company, it's not possible for a buyer to acquire it without also acquiring the whole company or a portion of it. Goodwill will appear as an asset in the balance sheet only when it is purchased in connection with the acquisition 
of control over another company. In that case, the capitalized cost of goodwill equals the fair value of the consideration exchanged, which is the acquisition price, for the company less the fair value of the net assets acquired. The fair value of the net assets equal the fair value of all identifiable tangible and intangible assets less the fair value of any liabilities of the selling company assumed by the buyer. Goodwill is a residual asset. It's the amount that's left over after the other assets are identified and valued. Just like for other intangible assets that have indefinite useful lives, we don't amortize goodwill. This makes it important that companies make every effort to identify specific intangibles other than goodwill that they acquire in a business combination since goodwill is the amount left after other assets have been identified. Goodwill is the excess of the fair value of the consideration exchanged over the fair value of the net assets acquired. The fair value of consideration exchanged is given as 180 million and fair value of net assets acquired is 130 million. The fair value of net of assets of 250 million minus the fair value of liabilities of 120 million. Therefore, by subtracting the fair value of net assets acquired, 130 million, from the fair value of consideration exchanged, of 180 million, we then determine the value of goodwill to be 50 million. This journal entry captures the effect of the acquisition of Smithson's assets and liabilities. So as you see, it acquired all the outstanding common stock of Ryder in exchange for 150 million cash. Smithson assumed all of Ryder's long-term liabilities, which have a value of 120 million at the date of acquisition. The fair values of all the identifiable assets of Ryder are shown. Receivables 50 million, inventory 70 million, property, plant, and equipment of 90 million, and a patent of 40 million. So the difference between the assets minus the liabilities and the cash exchanged gives us our goodwill of 50 million. Let's take a look at exercise 10-1. So on March 1st, Belden Corporation purchased land as a factory site for 60,000. An old building on the property was demolished and construction began on a new building that was completed on December 15, 2018. Costs incurred during this period are listed below. The demolition of the old building, 4000 Architect's fees for the new building, 12000 Legal fees for title investigation of land, 2000 property taxes on the land for the period beginning March 1st of 18, 3000 construction costs 500,000 interest on the construction loan $5,000 did i say construction costs 500,000 salvaged materials resulting from the demolition of the old building were sold for $2,000 so if we determine the amount that Belden should capitalize as the cost of the land and the new building, we're going to take for the land, the purchase price is $60,000. We'll add the demolition of four minus the sale of the materials to give us a net of $2,000 of cost. The legal fees for the title investigation are 2000 for a total cost 
of the land of 64000 Now the cost of the building would be the construction costs of 500000 the architect's fees of 12000 and the interest on the construction loan of 517000 Note that the property taxes on the land are a period cost. They incur every period, so those are going to be expensed. Let's now look at exercise 10-2. Oak Tree Company purchased new equipment and made the following expenditures. So the equipment, including sales tax, was purchased on an open account with payment due in 30 days. The other expenditures were paid in cash. So the way we will create the journal entry is to show a debit to equipment for 48,900, a credit to the accounts payable for 47,200, which is the purchase price along with the sales tax, and a credit to cash of 1700 which would include the freight charge and the installation of the equipment. The prepaid insurance would be an asset of 900 and we would credit cash for that $900. Let's look at a concept question for Goodwill. The Dearden Golf Ball Company acquired all of the outstanding common stock of Sanderson Golf for $1,750,000. The book values and fair values of Sanderson's assets and liabilities on the date of purchase were as follows. So we have our current assets, our property, plant and equipment, along with the liabilities. Dearden should record the goodwill for what they purchase it for, the $1,750,000, minus the fair value of the assets, less the liabilities. So the fair value of the assets, the four fifteen, dollars the 1470 less the liabilities, that difference against the purchase price would constitute goodwill. It's not unusual for a group of assets to be acquired for a single sum. If these assets are indistinguishable, 10 identical delivery trucks purchased for a lump sum price of 150,000 valuation is obvious. Each of the trucks would then be valued at 15,000. However, if the lump sum purchase involves different assets, it's necessary to allocate the lump sum acquisition price among the separate items. The assets acquired may have different characteristics and different useful lives. For example, the acquisition of a new factory may include assets that are significantly different as land, building, and equipment. Allocation is made in proportion to the individual assets relative fair values. This process is best explained by using an example as is on the slide. So we take the total amount of the fair value, which is 2,200,000. We allocate each asset based on the percent of the total. So with land, if the land's fair value is 330,000, if we divide that by 2.2 million, we come up with 15% of the total. The building, 25%, equipment, 30, patent 20, and inventories, 10% of the total. The relative fair value percentages are then multiplied by the lump sum purchase price to determine the initial valuation 
of each of the separate assets. Note that the lump sum purchase includes inventory. The procedure used here to allocate the purchase price in a lump sum acquisition pertains to any type of asset mix, not just to property, plant, and equipment and intangible assets. So let's take a look at another concept question. Cirrus Corporation acquired a manufacturing facility on five acres of land for a lump sum price of $32 million. The land included land improvements such as landscaping, a sprinkler system, and a parking lot. According to independent appraisals, the fair values were $18 million, $12 million, and $10 million for the building, land, and land improvements, respectively. The initial values of the building, land, and land improvements would be, as you see here, we've got the building, the land, and the land improvements. What the right answer would be the fair value is 40 million. The building would be the 18 divided by the 40 million or 14 million four hundred thousand. The land would be the 12 million divided by the 40 thousand or 30 percent of the lump sum price, 9 million. 600,000 and then the land improvements would be 25% times the 32 million or $8 million. Let's take a look at exercise 1010. Teradyne Corporation purchased land as a factory site and contracted with Maxter Construction to construct a factory. Teradyne made the following expenditures related to the acquisition of the land building and equipment for the factory. So as you see here, the purchase price of the land, the demolition and removal of the old building, the clearing and grading of the land before construction, various closing costs required for the land, architect's fees for the building, payments to Maxter for building construction, equipment purchased, freight charges on equipment, trees, plants, and other landscaping of 45000 sprinkler system of 5000 cost to build special platforms and install wiring for the equipment of 12000 cost of trial runs to ensure the installation of the equipment 7,000, fire and theft insurance on the factory for the first year of use is 24,000. So in addition to these expenditures, Teradine purchased four forklifts from Caterpillar. In payment, Teradine paid 16,000 cash and signed a non-interest bearing note requiring the payment of 70000 in one year. An interest rate of 7% properly reflects the time value of money for this type of loan. Determine the initial valuation of each of the assets that Teradine acquired in this transaction. So first, let's take a look at just the land. The land would be the purchase price of $1,200,000 plus the demolition and removal of the old building of $80,000, the clearing and grading of $150,000, and the closing costs. For a total cost of the land, $1,472,000. For the building, we're dealing with architect's fees and construction costs for $3,000,000. 300,000. Next, the equipment would be the purchase price of 860,000 along with the freight charges, 32,000, 
the special platforms and wire installation of 12000 and the cost of the trial runs for 7000 for a total cost of the equipment to be 900 11000 We've got land improvements of landscaping for 45000 and a sprinkler system for 5000 Then last, the forklifts, we're going to show the cost we initially paid plus the present value of 70000 in a year from now. So the number of periods is a year, the interest rate is 7%. So the 16000 plus the present value of that one lump sum payment in one year from now is $81,000. $421. Now the last piece, prepaid insurance, would be recorded as an asset since we're prepaying the insurance for an entire year. So guys, I'm going to stop now and start again with Lecture 2.